Welcome back from the non-coffee coffee break, or the coffee non-coffee break. I know there was. There wasn't supposed to be. So that was a very nice surprise. Thank you to IHP. It's my pleasure to introduce again the wonderful Tim Chartier. For those of you who just arrived today, and I know there are a few of you in the audience, Tim is a professor of mathematics from Davidson College in North Carolina in the United States. He is also visiting at MoMath. He is the distinguished visiting professor for the public dissemination of mathematics for this year. And we are delighted to have him. I'll add one more uh, piece of historical information for those of you who were here yesterday and heard that already. Um, when the Museum of Mathematics was first getting started, and this is our 10th year, our 10 year anniversary, but about 11 or 12 years ago, I went to a conference of mathematicians and just convened a meeting with people I didn't know and uh, wanted to know and told them we were thinking about opening a museum of math in New York City. And a number of those mathematicians agreed to serve on our advisory council. And uh, this gentleman here agreed to chair the advisory council without knowing anything about me or us or who we were. And so he is, in a way, very instrumental to the creation of MoMath. And so it is really a pleasure to introduce Tim Chartier. Thank you, Cindy. Well, it is wonderful to be here. And it is wonderful to see the many things that you're doing to bring math to, to many, or it, as we have here, math for all. And as we've talked about, we want to create a certain energy and a certain pleasure in mathematics. Yesterday, we heard that we want to show why we like math. For me, that's actually just what I do because I don't know what else to share but what I enjoy. So we're going to walk through some of those today. You're largely seeing kind of what I call a buffet or a smorgasbord of the mathematics that I do. I'm a bit of an eclectic person, so I have eclectic interests in mathematics. And it was actually when I saw that math was diverse that I actually began to move toward mathematics. I was originally a theater arts person and it was when I took mathematical proofs and saw that a proof could be elegant, that it could almost be like poetry, that suddenly I, I went home and I said, I think I'm gonna pick up a math major, theater double major, and I never picked up the theater double major. I became a math major in the process. Well, it turns out that we have some breaking news. There is a missing Eiffel Tower. I know we saw it last night, but we need to see actually what's going on. But before I show you the Eiffel Tower that's missing, there's another piece of breaking news. And that is that there is a museum that is up for a prize. And it is MoMath. And you can actually vote in the United States, and it's actually legal. You can go to vote.momath.org. And then you look through the grid, you click vote on MoMath, and then somewhat non-intuitively go back up and then actually click the vote. MoMath was ahead for several days. Last night, they were slightly behind. And there are enough people here that at least last night, we would move right back into the lead. So feel free to support MoMath in that way because there is a cash prize that comes with that. So what's the deal with the Eiffel Tower? It's missing, or at least as said in the small print, mathematically. Well, it comes via a puzzle, which is based on the missing leprechaun puzzle, if you're familiar with that. And so if you just count the number of Eiffel Towers, it would be wonderful if we, if we had more than one, just because then we could have not all been collected at one window last night, which would have been nice. So we have 14, which opens its own discussion of how did you count that, which you can do if you have a longer talk, or that's all you want to do with a group of children. Well, if you look carefully, this is actually a physical puzzle. For now, it's digital so that we can all see it. There are three pieces. So there's one long piece along the bottom, and then there are two pieces on the top. Do you see that? So I'm going to move them. There is nothing happening. It is digital, but there is no tomfoolery, as we say in the United States, which I'm not exactly sure what that means. But there's no kind of weirdness going on with this. I just literally swap them. And we just count to make sure that there are 14. And there are 14, but it's 14 plus 1. We suddenly have the missing Eiffel Tower on the previous slide. Well, how did that happen? OK, wait. So we have 14, then we switch this, and we have 15. Very odd, very strange. Children, youth, 
me with a PhD, will just sit there and do it again and again, trying to figure it out. Well, the thing that I love about this is the actual solution is quite simple, is that the slide with 14 is on top, just in a different ordering. And then on the bottom, the, the one that has 15 corresponds to this slight shift, where each one loses a 14th of itself. This is not mag math or magical at all. This isn't even interesting unless you've seen the other. But it teaches a very helpful lesson of mathematics. Because this is quite simple, where this could actually seem quite complex. And that in itself is such an important lesson of mathematics, is that through the lens of, go ahead, I'll go back. Through the lens of mathematics, the complex can be simple. We talk about that math is hard. I think a crossword puzzle is hard. I think poetry is hard. I think mime is hard. I have never gone out to figure out a piece that I could perform for you and just magically begin to do mime. I don't instantly write a poem. I don't instantly do a crossword puzzle. And yet somehow we think that sometimes with math, unless we do it instantly, it means that we're not supposed to do it. Math are more like puzzles, and it's the enjoyment of the process that we may not even get to the end. It's the process. I have research ideas that may never be solved by me, but they're enjoyable nonetheless. But it's in that aha moment that suddenly something complex can look simple, and we can suddenly understand it. So if you're interested in this, this is actual computer code I wrote, so I actually can pick what you want it to be. So I picked the Eiffel Tower because we're here. And you can pick another image. So for instance, the Guardian decided on April Fool's to actually pick the Empire State Building. So their title was, The Empire State Building is Missing. And it got quite a few hits because people were quite concerned with New York City, <laughs> which was quite fun. The original one was going to be David Beckham. But can anybody think of the problem when, it, when you keep removing one four, or 1 14th? One of those 1 14ths is, is his head. And so you quickly pick up what's going on. Buildings work the best. So let me show that to you really quick. Just, can you see it on the second one? They're pretty small because they're the Empire State Building. Yeah, they're slightly off too. I had a hard time getting that centered. But if you look carefully, you can pick up that something's missing. But with buildings, it's harder to pick up. With people, you instantly see it. OK, so that's my first little puzzle for you. And that's a version of a dissection puzzle. So this is one that became very popular on the internet. This is using Photoshop. It's not a physical puzzle. But Tanya and I, being mimes, decided, well, maybe it can be a physical puzzle. It's an animated GIF. So we just took one of the frames and gave it to an artist. And he made, in the upper right, a very large version of that chocolate bar, which we perform. Tanya comes out with the large a uh, chocolate bar, puts it down, moves the pieces, has the one piece, takes a bite. I'm sorry, she takes the bite, then moves the pieces. And then suddenly, I come out, and she's taken a bite of our chocolate bar. Tanya says, wait, moves it around, and it's instantly back together. I'm pleased. And then we walk off, and she shows the audience her missing piece. The picture that you see there was when we performed in Tokyo for a sold-out audience. We had two sold-out audiences in Tokyo in the Panasonic Center. At the end of the show, out of all, last, last night, yes, yesterday afternoon, you saw a 10 to 15 minute show. Even the pieces you saw were shorter versions of longer pieces that we do. The ball and the bag that Tanya did can in itself go 10 to 15 minutes with that, particularly if you have children. And the, the full show is 45 minutes, and there's, you'll see a couple things in a minute. There are many things that people find fascinating. But in Japan, it was the chocolate bar. Tanya was flooded with children at the front, as you see in the picture. And they, they just wanted her to do it again and again and again. <laughs> and you heard what many of you have commented on. Ah. And then they saw it. And luckily, Tanya lived eight months in Japan at one time, so she could speak to them. And um, one very just, just you feel like this is a group of friends, so I'll share a story rather than just the talk. The funniest moment for me was the introduction was that we're behind a screen. We can't see the audience. Yesterday, we could see you. But we usually have a screen. We're waiting. They're introducing us in Japanese. 
I'm doing the introduction piece, which was the infinite rope. And I suddenly occurs to me, I don't even know what he's saying. And I look over at Tanya and I went, I can't say anything if this isn't going well. Because if a show goes a little, little sideways in a show we're planning to be silent, I'll just start talking. And then I just move into speech, get things back in order, and then move back into mime. We couldn't do that. And Tanya looked in my eyes, and she could tell, uh-oh, this is not Tim that we want performing. And she just smiled gently at me, and she said, trust your material. And I went, all right. And I went out and did the piece, and there was the silence in the room which if you were teaching or presenting the silence of the room that we knew that we had the audience for the next 40 minutes. So that was a gift. This version of the dissection puzzle of a missing Empire State Building and missing uh, Eiffel Tower has a missing monkey. Actually, one appears and one misses, if I remember the puzzle correctly. I know exactly where it is in the museum. Is at MoMath, which you see in the wheel, and I believe that was drawn by Larry Gonick, who is a very talented, yeah, the monkeys were drawn by Larry, a very talented artist, and is a fun version that people physically play with, and you see them again, moving in and standing there and trying to figure out how it happens. So as mentioned, Tanya and I trained with Marcel Marceau multiple times. Uh, Cindy asked, does he talk, or did he talk? Yes, a lot uh, in class, and was very, very eloquent. And, and very giving as, as a teacher. One of his main principles was that mime makes visible the invisible, or makes, yeah, makes the, makes the invisible visible. He'd say it both ways. I think it's one of the reasons why mime, if you do it right, in the right way, which is very difficult, can be very captivating for mathematical audiences, because so much of the mathematical world is not tangible. It's why your math museums are so powerful, because it brings something tangible to us that when we can take this world inside of our minds and then actually share it with each other. There are some sketches that we do that when we do them at a academic institution, you'll see a professor parent turn to the child and say, that's what I do. Almost like that's what's in my head. I want to share a sketch that is a sketch that we can bring uh, internationally, but we were very pleased we didn't need to, which you'll understand in a minute. There are many ways to connect this mathematically. I'm going to do the quickest, which is you will see Tanya. She had shorter hair at the time of the filming, but you'll know it's Tanya. You will kind of not see me, so I'm the other thing. And I am somehow in the other thing. So the mathematical question for you is, where am I?
There you go. <laughs> So we will leave where was I for the break in terms of that or for the question. I can talk about it in the Q&A if it's really bothering you. Um, there is nothing in there but me. Occasionally when you, I actually usually don't even point that out because the one where it goes very high, um, it goes very high for the audience. Uh, kids will have these really ornate ways that we're doing it and it's all much simpler. So if you want to be disappointed, you can actually ask how we're doing it in terms of that. But it's actually choreographed to be physically or um, spatially disorienting for you. It's specifically designed to actually pull that off. The ordering is done that way. We also, really quickly, I don't show slides on this, but we also connect that to topology. So we'll have that character do the rubber sheet geometry of the alphabet, if you're familiar with that. If not, you can ask me about that as well. And I could share slides with you on that. There's actually a video of that as well on Vimeo. All right, I have another breaking news for you that actually happened, and it was quite amazing. So there's a math theorem that basically says that you can't take a circle and make it into a knot. In other words, if I have just this, and if you look at it carefully, I'm part of the circle. Can you see that? The rope is part, and then I'm the rest of it. I can't make it into a knot unless, like I just did, I let go. But what was absolutely amazing was that at the New York Math Festival a week and a half ago, we were in downtown Manhattan, and all of a sudden, Tanya and these three, this family of three came up and actually came up with a counterexample. So it turns out that you just have to go around and then in and then out and then pull. And you have it. It's absolutely, <laughs> well, hold on. I, I, wait, I didn't make it complicated enough. I think they made it, oh, that's right, they did it twice. So, and then they went around again. And then they had the counter, dang it. Well, we do this with children. And it's absolute, I don't know how things work in other countries. So I'll just, uh, you may work the same, so I'm just telling you how things work the same. But if not, in the United States, they'll have school presentations. And like half the school, if it's a big school, will come. So there'll be 300 kids out there. If the kindergartner's coming, they often come with a rug. They come with a rug square. They put their little square down. They sit on the rug and then everyone's there. And we come out, and then we talk about the theorem. And then I go, Tanya, this is when we're done to get, when we're doing this together. Tanya, look, I actually have, I actually can prove it's wrong. Look, I have a knot. And in pre-COVID times, Tanya would go, no, you don't, because it's a theorem. And a theorem means it, you do not have one unless indeed the theorem's wrong, but this theorem's right. No, no, look, Tanya. And she goes, no, and she blows on it, which is what takes it out. And I go, no, 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 just like I did with you. So then I make the more complicated one. Then she turns to the kids and goes, is that a knot? And it's amazing, 300 kids, no. You know, they're just like, Ugh. And then she goes, all right, let's blow together, which now we have them fan with their hands. And, and so they do that, the whole thing comes out. I, Oh, no, 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 that, I, it, it's more complicated than that. Then I try to make three, which doesn't always work, but I try to make three. She asks again, and it's booming. I mean, it's like, you know, what do you want out of math? Two, you know what I mean? It's like, forget circle the number. We're going to collectively yell the answer with this. And then, of course, it comes out. It's, it's just an incredibly delightful moment. And hidden underneath that is what I like, is that the PhD in math in the room is completely wrong. And while we don't emphasize that or talk about that, we can. Because a lot of my research life is being wrong. A lot of my research life is being completely confused. And as an artist, a lot of my time is not knowing how to create the piece I want to create, which is actually what attracted me to math. Calculus was rather uninteresting to me, because I'm like, look, they already told me it can be solved. I mean, they're telling me to solve a problem that they can clearly be solved. I mean, I can do it, but why? But then when it seemed more open-ended, and even if I knew that I could prove it, but I, I might have a different path than you, I might think of multiple paths and think of the most elegant, things became the most interesting to me. Another thing I like doing with math is in class, because I teach, is actually just using math to motivate things. So for this one, the day that we're doing triple integrals, you can do it with double integrals, I'll point out that we're finding a center of mass. And I'll say, well, you know, what are we doing today? Well, it turns out we're finding a center of mass 
which can actually help you balance things. So this is basically what we're doing today in calculus. <laughs> Sorry, I had that on my face and then I, I lost it. I can teach anything for the next 15 minutes. They are so engaged with that. <laughs> and if I bring enough newspaper, which I didn't today, I can actually teach everyone in the room. So I'm going to try really quickly just to show you the trick here. You hold it on corner to corner, OK? Let me wait for people who wanted to video this. That was all right. You hold it corner to corner, and then you try to get it as flat as you can. You see how I keep kind of shaking it to keep it as flat? Because I'm looking at, do you see the bump? I'm trying to get that bump there, that bump. It's called a temporary fold. Then I just squeeze both ends, and then I, then, hold on. There. Then I look at the top, and if it moves this way, I go that way at the bottom. If it goes that way, I go that way at the bottom. And that's it. And it turns out it's actually much easier with a newspaper than it is, for instance, with a broom because it's, it moves slowly. The problem in class is that the kids, thank you. The kids usually know, the kids, the youth, the students, the college students usually know that I balance a chair on my chin. And so that the next question is, can you do a chair on your chin? But I can't, like, I can't do that because it hurts. And so I can only do certain <laughs> things. Well, I did this one with the New York Times and uh, tweeted it. And it actually got picked up by the New York Times, where they, um, they like the idea of having balanced news. And so uh, <laughs> and then underneath it, it was actually a description, like I just said, of how to do it. So that was quite, that was quite fun, really fun for my students. All right, we're going to walk through a museum. So one of the nice things about walking through a museum, there are many, many here, is that you actually can see art pieces you know. So we're going to do something a little different. I've mathematically created art pieces because I can't create the pieces that we see here. Even in the hotel, the artwork is much better than anything I can do. So I've created them in that way. All right, so here we have a matrix. Okay, So we have a matrix. What piece is that? I don't know. Let's try again. We'll, go la we'll zoom out. We're a little too close. Do you recognize it yet? How about now? How about now? How about now? And there you go. You should see it now. And where were we in the beginning? Right there. That's where we were in the beginning. So this is actually an app. Oh, I didn't put the URL on there. Um, I'm sorry. The, uh, you can email me. I, can, I won't remember it off the top of my head. I have other apps that you can play with. Um, so that'll be OK. Let's do another one. Let's say that I wanted to, you know, you see artists in Paris just, just painting. And it's like, you know, I can't really do that. What if instead I just tapped on my phone with emoji? So let's try that. This is not a piece that's in the Louvre. I started with one that is. So what art piece am I drawing there? Oof, I don't know. So I'll just use more emoji. Maybe recognizable. So instead, I'll just do it with even more. And even more made entirely with emoji. Well, how am I doing this? What in the world? Well, let's talk about the math. How do you do this? Well, you take the image. Then you create a grid. If you're not using color, you turn it into grayscale, as you see in the image. And then for each grid point, you find its average color. So you're just taking all those numbers and finding their average. That's it. And that's a color from 0 to 255. And that's what you see here. And then. Each of those squares is replaced by something. It's replaced by a, a character that's darker or lighter. It's created by an emoji that would be close to the average color. Or you replace it with circles, depending on its average color. And there is the URL for the circle one. That was created in preparation for a potential topic for something I will do at MoMath. I was working on a series of these for that. And these were quite popular on Twitter. So I just kept making them and tweeting them for a while. Um, the Mona Lisa was the most popular image that I would tend to do. And then this was the most popular one, was the polynomial. So this is a polynomial where each uh, square is a polynomial where it has roots at the end. That's why it's meeting. And then it has a number of roots in the middle. I do numerical analysis, so that's quite trivial for me. I learned by putting it on Twitter, it's not for everyone else. Um, but if you, 
if you, I co-wrote a textbook in numerical analysis that was not hard for me to think. And so it was fun to put this up. I didn't say it was the Mona Lisa. I just said, what do you see? And um, the dominant things was, of course, the Mona Lisa. And then also was uh, Jesus Christ. And the other one was John Lennon. So those were the most uh, <laughs> popular, popular answers. I want to show you a trick really quick, and then um, that might be the end of my time. You may have seen this trick before, but I want to show it to you nonetheless, because I want to show you how it can be done in PowerPoint, because I did this another way for an audience, and then a child came up and taught me this way to do it in PowerPoint, which I think is really fun. So I'm going to read our collective minds. So the important thing is I could have an envelope here with a number written in it. The problem is probably about 75% of the time I forget the envelope. So instead, I've actually infused the number into the slides. I'm not going up to the computer. I'm not somehow clicking something that puts it in there. The way this works is I have a grid. And then we're, we're going to pick a number. And when you pick that number, that row and column goes away. And then you choose from the remaining numbers. OK? That's the way it's going to work. All right, so you go ahead. You pick the first number and just kind of tell me where it is. Zero, OK. We're starting with the zero, so we'll click that. Oops, uh-oh. Oh, I got to, wait, why? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not sure why that's not working on the slide. Yeah, OK, I'll show you why it works. I'm sorry about that. I'm, I've tested that before. Huh. Well, anyway, if we did that, no matter what happened, I would have gotten a very important number. I would have gotten 30. And how did that work exactly? The, the work is the part I actually want to show you is how it works. The way it works is that you give each column and each row a number. Do you see that? The part that wasn't seen in the puzzle? The 415203, the 152403. When you add those up, that will be 30. That is the sum that you're looking for, is the sum of those numbers. Because those interior numbers of the matrix are its column and row sum numbers. Do you see it? And that's it. I'm sorry the trick didn't work. I don't, one of the tricks of PowerPoint, I guess. Okay. We could do it in the member column. Yeah, you can make your own. So, oh yeah, we, let's do something else. We'll do, we could do that. Um, I want to go to something that came up really quick. I'm going to possibly go over by two or three minutes, but uh, I, want to, I forgot that this was in here. So yesterday, it was often brought up at least three times, this idea that what about people who aren't mathematical? What about people who don't like math? And for that, I want to talk about math and sports, which is my research area. That's what I do. This week, I was actually going to Zoom with the National Basketball Association because I am a consultant for the league office on anti-cheating analytics, where let's be sure the game is playing, being played correctly. How did I get into that? Well, it turns out I had three students who walked in my office and asked if we could form a group. I had three students asking me to do work for free outside of class. Yes. <laughs> Their question, though, was, can we create analytics for our basketball team? I said, yes, we can, but they may not want them. And if you're OK with that, I'll do it. Yes, we're OK. So we started with three. We named the group Cat Stats, which sounds like we do veterinarian analytics. <laughs> um, it's because we're the Davidson Wildcats. We started with three. The group became so large that it's now a student group. It grew to be over 100. It literally doubled, er, literally doubled every year and then uh, tapped out at 100. From there, we've been posed questions from the New York Times. One of my students works for the Chicago Bulls, which is an NBA basketball team. Another student worked for the New York Jets, which is an American football team. And then the Chicago Sky is the WNBA, the women's NBA worked for them. And then, as we see in the middle, we work for a lot of college teams, including what we call soccer. One of the things I love about this is you can get many people involved. So here, we see that in March, a big thing in the United States in March is what's called March Madness where we try to predict a tournament. It's like trying to predict the FIFA tournament. It's a similar to that type of thing. Here you see 500 kids coming to Davidson College for me to teach them how to do this, for them to learn math. Just not the accelerated math students. Everyone comes. And the room is silent because we have the motivation and we have the technique in terms of what to do. So I want to show you one really quick thing. I know that it's basketball-centered. 
There is a way to do it with soccer, but it's a little bit of a weak connection. And given that I'm in Europe, I'm not willing to do it because I think that many of you will just, who enjoy soccer will be like, that's your analytics. It works very well with basketball. So here we have Stephen Curry. Stephen Curry went to my college. Steph is one of the huge names in international basketball. He has a global presence. He shoots uh, from wildly far away from the, the uh, basket. Turns out he was a very good math student. Well, I'm actually going to take a moment to tell this story, because this could actually be helpful for you to know if you are, live in a country that follows basketball at all. First time I ever heard of Steph Curry was in a department meeting. Stefan took Calc 1. We have Calc 1 with no previ previous exposure. Most of our majors do not come out of there. I'm at what's called a highly selective liberal arts school. Some of our students actually turn down Ivy Leagues to come to our smaller college and to work with faculty directly to do research. But we can have very talented students come out of Calc 1. So the question came up, who's particularly talented in Calc 1? The professor said, oh, well, there's this one new basketball player. He's really good. Oh, well, maybe we should encourage him to be a major. No, 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 no. I mean, he's going to start. I don't think he's going to want to walk through all the calculus while he's in season. I don't think he's going to choose that. Well, we got very defensive. We've had basketball players before. And this professor, in a very uh, American Southern style, just sat back, relaxed in his chair, and he said, you don't understand. This kid is really good. He was talking about Stephen Curry. About a month later, Tanya and I were in the free seats that faculty get for basketball games, which means we were in the back. And we're watching the game, and there's a moment, I still remember it, Stefan was going from my left to my right. And if you watch basketball, or you watch anything with the, just the superlative athletes, it's like everyone turned still, except for him. And I saw that, and I turned to Tanya, and I pointed at Stephen Curry, and I said, Tanya, that's the kid in Calc 1. <laughs> so yesterday, Stephen uh, had a graduation ceremony. He was unable to go to, he graduated. He left a year early, and he promised his mom and the coach that he would complete his degree. It took him 12 years, and he did. And he was unable to attend graduation, which he planned to attend, but his team went much farther in the playoffs. And if they had not gone as far, he would have attended. So the college had one for him yesterday. So last night when we came back from the reception, Tanya and I enjoyed, uh, uh, many of our friends sent us pictures of Stephen graduating yesterday. So we're going to play Steph Curry in basketball. You're going to actually shoot better than him. You're going to flip a coin. Now, I'm not going to have us flip a coin because I can do this sometimes with children, and that can be both hazardous and disastrous all at one time. And so what happens is it's already pre-flipped, and you just guess heads or tails. If you guess correctly, then you've made the shot. If you guess incorrectly, then you miss the shot, OK? So we're going to just try it five times, then we're going to try it for real. So this one, if you goof up, don't worry about it. All right, so make a guess. All right, so if you guessed tails, you made the shot. If you guessed heads, you didn't. And now you keep track of how many you've made. Does, it, does everybody understand? So guess again. And again, and again, and again. Did you do it? That's the pace we'll have, OK? All right, so we were trying to see if you got three out of five. So if you got three out of five or more, three or more out of five, raise your hand. Well, quite a bit. Well, there's math behind that that we could show that it's 31%. If we had 10,000 people, we don't actually need to do the math because the math tells us that we can let people raise their hand and we'll get approximately how many people should be getting it. In this room, not so much. Kind of the question yesterday about sample size. OK, here we go. Steph Curry in 2014 played a game where he made 11 out of 13 three-pointers. If you don't follow basketball, then all you have to do is go, whoa. And it looks like you know basketball. That's just amazing in terms of what he did. So here we go. He was shooting 44%, a little bit below. 44% that year, you will shoot 50% because you are flipping a coin that has been pre-flipped with a random number generator, just for the sake of clarity. OK, so make your guess. Make a 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 guess. Three more. Make a guess. Make a guess. Make a guess. Did anyone get 11 or more out of 13? See, we just need a much bigger conference in terms of that. It's really fun when that, this audience actually works really well because nobody did. But it works really well when I speak to like a 1,000 people because you have a few hands, just so few go up in terms of what we had. 
And then you can talk about simulation, like where you have more people, that you would see that it's under 1%, and that's a probability that you approximate. When I was called by ESPN to help them with their probabilities, I didn't always do them analytically. Sometimes I know enough probability to know I can get them wrong, that they can be very difficult, but I can simulate them. This one, if you wanted to do the math, you could treat it as a Bernoulli trial and teach people that as well. So I actually have a book coming out. It's called Get in the Game. But what I wanted to, that does this type of uh, sports analytics with flipping coins and rolling dice, but what I really wanted to focus on was the role of the museum in lives like people like me, where I'm not a museum. I'm a prof doing outreach just on my own. This whole idea of doing flipping and coins came from my actually doing a family Friday at MoMath. MoMath is you need to do things interactively, which I like to do. And I had been working on the book that you see here that's coming out in about a week. I had been working on that for several years and nothing worked. And for that family Friday, I turned to Tanya and I went, I think this is it. And then everyone showed up and then you watched the room and I turned to Tanya and I said, this is the book. It took me six or seven years to write, but this is the book in terms of what it has. And I think that museums can play huge roles in elevating someone's voice in those types of ways. So for my talk, my main thing to you is actually connected to what Nikki said as well. What, are, what interested you in math? These are things that interest me. Sports, performing, math, and computing. It's a bit odd combination. People who follow me on Twitter, half of them probably really like sports and half of them really like performing. My performing group love what I'm tweeting from here. The sports group is patiently waiting for the Tim they know to come back, which happened last night. Here's all these Steph Curry bits of information. They're like, ah, yes, retweet, retweet, and then we go back into the performing with this. So I thank you all for what you do and what is the smorgasbord of mathematics that you can share that is distinctly you, that distinctly pulls people into math so that mathematics can be enjoyed for all. Thank you for your attention. Do you have any questions? Oh, there you go. Thank you. OK, I'll tell a story until you think of a question. So with the tube, when I first got the tube, it's 25 feet long. The tube, the one, the slinky, the silver slinky I was in. When I first got it, I took it into the basement of my house. I got it when I was living at home. And I went downstairs, and my parents went for a walk, which they did every day together. And they, they came home, and my mom, my mom suddenly hears, Mom? Dad? And they come downstairs, Tim? They come down, they look, the tube is completely sprawled across the entire basement. And they go, what are you doing? I was trying to practice this thing. I don't know how to get out. <laughs> <laughs> so Tanya and I, neither of us have been able to figure out how I didn't know how to get out. But nonetheless, I did not know how to get out. I had been trying and was literally stuck in terms of the tube. All right, that gave you a moment. Do you have any questions? Um, yeah, I have a question. I didn't get the thing which uh, turned out to be 30 in the end. So you... you yeah, um, let's go do it on the board like the Tim said. And the, the yeah. so what happened then? Yes, yes like that. thank you. Yeah, so you, you would cross out the row and the column, and then you end up with, what do I have, six numbers, and only the remaining numbers, you add them up, and it will be 30. Yeah, thank you. It's so clear when the app works that I don't have to say that much because it just unfolds itself. Thank you. I'm sorry that was unclear. That was originally a Martin Gardner trick um, that came from one of his books. I actually found that before MoMath um, created it. Or I, I might have skipped that slide inadvertently. MoMath also has that as a display as well. Anybody else? Cindy. I just want to add to the comment about this being something that Martin Gardner uh, was involved with because I had the, the great honor of meeting Martin Gardner uh, before the museum was built and he asked us to include uh, 
not this puzzle, but the rearrangement puzzle that you did in the beginning with the, in our museum, it's with the monkeys, but the very first thing he showed, Martin Gardner said that puzzle uh, got more letters. He would respond to every letter that people sent. He got more letters about that puzzle than anything he ever did. And he said he felt that brought more people to mathematics than anything else he did in his entire career. Wow. And so he asked us actually to include both of those puzzles, but this was the one he said would bring more people to math than anything else. Oh, thanks, that's wonderful. Anybody else? Let me show you the rope trick, and we can think if there's one more trick after that. Oh, you have a question? Well, let me show you the rope trick quickly, and then we'll dig the question. <laughs> Since you asked the question, I won't teach the rope trick. So let's do the rope trick real quick. I was taught this by Matt Parker. Um, so you go over your arm and around like that, okay? Then you go in the, the circle. It's not really a circle, but blob. But for, for kids, it's somehow a circle. And then you go back through the triangle. Do you see it there? Then this hand you pull through, you're actually done. But you make it tight so you can get the other hand out and then tighten it like that. Let's do it one more time. You go around, in the circle, out the triangle, pull your hand through, then tighten it because you might have it and it's just going to fall through. Yeah. There you go. All right. You have a question. OK. So I would be interested in uh, how you usually embed these examples in, in, in practice. So you, I mean, obviously show how it works, how you have, for example, with the, with the uh, monkeys or with the Eiffel Tower, uh, would you normally explain more details about that or is it more about, you know, experiencing it's how both. that works? It's both, yes, that's a good question. Sometimes it's literally- It depends on the age maybe also. Yes, it depends the, on the age, audience. it depends on the setting, it depends on what they're asking me to do in terms of that. And so, like the, um, Eiffel Tower one, it's actually created exactly the way you saw it in the solution. I create them that way and then cut them each at their precise point and then rearrange them into the way that you see it on the slide, if that makes any sense. And sometimes that's what people want to know. And other times, you know, somebody's like, well, you know, I don't even know that. So yeah. It would be a step-by-step -step explanation of how yeah. um, to actually get the point of what's happening. Yeah, and a really good example of that is just at the New York Math Festival, like even just this rope trick, that some, some children, like man, there was one child, Tanya must have been with that child for 45 minutes. Just the, each thing, like, and when they're that interested, Tanya is, has done K-12 education, we tend to shift them over to Tanya because she's so good at that discovery learning with children. And um, I actually, because of my artistics, I am so intuitive that I don't really know how I do half of what I do anyway. So it doesn't help with teaching. Like, how did you do that? I don't know, you know, in, in that. But it's, it's wonderful to have her, where Tanya's back there, which is why I keep pointing to this. Thing. It's, it's, the wall is really helpful, but that's why I keep pointing at her. Is there one more question? And I think we're at lunchtime. <laughs> the thing that will prompt, no question. I think we're at lunchtime. And so. <laughs> well, thank you so Good, much. Good, thank you. Talk.